goed, ja. Uh, Martin Sherman's The Moral Arc. Ja, de, de lezing van vanavond uh, was eigenlijk een soort van samenvatting heel snel van uh, wat hij in zijn boek uh, uiteenzet. En uh, wat denk ik heel erg goed is dat er ook eens een keer gezegd wordt dat het iemand dat ook doet met alle argumenten en alle empirische data, alle wetenschappelijke studies achter de hand. Dat er alles netjes uiteengezet. Dus een heel dik boek geworden, precies daardoor, is dat de wetenschap de samenleving vooruit brengt. speaker, one person, one revolutionary to stand up and say, uh, that's enough, we're not going to put up with this anymore. And that uh, begins with protest. King was a Baptist uh, preacher and he uh, got this phrase from a uh, 19th century Unitarian abolitionist named Theodore Parker who said in the moral universe, I, I cannot calculate its curve, but I can define by conscience that it's bending toward justice. That's where King got this in the first place, so hardly copyrighted. In any case, uh, The, uh, we, we don't have to depend on uh, divine conscience. We can actually calculate it with data. We now have 118 uh, democracies. Uh, it's 48 or higher on the uh, poly scale of 196 countries. So that's real moral progress as I've defined it, which I'll come back to at the end of the talk, of why I think democracies are objectively, morally better than other forms of governance. One of the part, part of the controversial part of my book, at least in America, uh, here, is that religion is not the major driving force of moral progress. Uh, and then, of course, one of the counters is, well, but the Quakers and the Mennonites agitated for the abolition of slavery. That's true. William Wilberforce stood up in Parliament and you know, agitated for decades uh, for the abolition of slavery. That's true. He did. He was a deeply religious man. But who were his primary opponents? Who, were he, who was he fighting against? It was his fellow religionists, his fellow Anglicans, who had tons of theological and biblical arguments in favor of the slave trade. Same thing with the Quakers, they were agitating for a century before, before anything actually happened. It didn't happen until the majority of people started adapting the kind of rights language that people use, started to use at the time. People should never be treated as a means to an end, but are an end in of themselves. That's Immanuel Kant. People should be treated equally under the law. Uh, and, you know, John Locke, and, and so forth. These are ideas that were created by Enlightenment philosophers, not theological uh, moralists, who then later adopted those ideas. Like Dr. King said his biggest influence was the most liberal theologians and Gandhi. And you would not consider Gandhi religious in any Western sense. Uh, and then finally, we're also in the middle of, uh, of, of another rights revolution, animal rights, uh, which really begins with Jeremy Bentham's question Uh, really, it was just a footnote in one of his great works. Uh, the question is not can they reason or can they talk, but can they feel, can they suffer? Can, can they suffer? Uh, and, and so I, I, I begin with this idea of the survival and flourishing, the non-suffering of sentient beings. This should be our consent. This is our starting point, where we build from there. And uh, I use the phrase sentient beings because, after all, you know, we are... We are primates. We are great apes. We're one of the great apes. The gibbons, gorillas, chimps, bonobos, and us. We are the we are one of them. Um, so what's been happening then uh, for um, for the last several centuries is that moral arc has been bending. How far? I claim that everyone today, conservatives included, are more liberal than liberals were in the 1950s. You don't see signs like this anymore. If you uh, analyze literature and novels, pop culture editorial cartoons, and so forth, it's all shifted. Nobody talks about Jews and blacks and women and so forth today like they did half a century ago. So the whole point of what I'm calling enlightenment humanism, the stuff that's been happening over the last couple centuries, is that instead of moralizing about evil, we use science and reason to solve problems. That is, how can we get rates of homicide down? How can we stop wars and things like that? 
It begins with the scientific revolution, at least that's where I begin the story. Uh, that is, uh, the scientific revolutionaries, Copern you know, Bacon, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, they discover that the universe is governed by natural laws that we can understand, write them down with mathematical equations, make predictions based on those, predictable hypotheses, test them and see if it works, and then use that knowledge to change the world. And that's what's happened ever since. So again, the formula is, democracies are better than autocracies, it's not to be, we ought to spread democracy wherever we can. Why? Because democracies place more emphasis on individual rights and individual liberty than any other form of governance, and thus they promote the survival and flourishing of sentient beings. So that phrase, that's my starting point. The survival and flourishing of sentient beings is the basis for establishing values and morals, which I claim, I'm now back on page one of my book, I'm kind of sort of backwards. I claim evolution vouchsafed us with an instinct to survive and thrive, and that that's where natural rights come from. Uh, and that, uh, so determining the conditions by which sentient beings best flourish ought to be the goal of a science of morality. We are, in fact, made from the stars. Our atoms were forged in the interiors of ancient stars that ended their lives in spectacular paroxysms of supernova explosions that dispersed those atoms into space, where they coalesced into new solar systems with planets, life, and sentient beings capable of such sublime knowledge and moral wisdom. We are stardust. We are gold. We are billion-year-old carbon. Morality is something that carbon atoms can embody <coughs> given a billion years of evolution. The moral art. Thank you. Ik kende hem van Scientific American en ik vind het een leuke stukje schreef. Maar hier zag ik hoe enthousiast en hoe onderbouwd hij zijn verhaal gaf. En uh, dat vond ik geweldig. Het is altijd leuk om Michael Shermer te zien. Hij is uh, super rationeel. Hij brengt het toch altijd heel charmant en dat is uh, wel echt een prestatie. Uh, geen uh, cynicus, uh, heel betrokken met zijn onderwerp, met zijn publiek. En uh, gebracht op een manier waar wij nog een heleboel van kunnen leren. Dus uh, absoluut aanraden. Uh, well, thanks everybody for a lovely evening here in Tilburg. Uh, it's a great audience. I thought it was um, that was my best talk yet on the European book tour uh, in terms of the feedback and the interesting comments and questions people had. So I learned a lot. In fact, I posed a moral dilemma that I haven't solved to see if the audience would solve it. So I think we now have the final truth on moral dilemmas. <laughs>